All right, good morning. My name is Will Stoner. I'm the Associate State Director for Outreach and Livable Communities for AARP. I'm a Long Island resident, and uh, thank you for coming today. AARP has 600,000 members just on Long Island between Nassau and Suffolk County. So thank you for being a member. Uh, we have 2.5 million members in New York, 37 million members in the country. And uh, I'll tell you, I am thrilled today to be part of this collaboration between the Dana Alliance and ARP. The Dana Alliance uh, helps us by bringing these fabulous events all across the country with our state offices. And th the reason it's so important to me is because our membership, when we ask them what are they looking for, what are they concerned about, and what would they like ARP to help them with if they can, the FOP Five top concerns are staying mentally sharp, staying physically fit, eating right, staying socially active, and staying fiscally sound. This program today covers four out of the five of those top concerns. So the value of this program, by the end, you'll see, speaks for itself. So I want to thank you again for coming out today. This is a, a fabulous event. I'm glad you could come. And uh, I want to also thank Drew Scott for moderating today. Everyone knows Drew Scott, right? Um, yes. Thank you. And uh, Laura will come up, and she'll, she'll do the other introductions. But really, thanks a lot. And, and I want to thank the Dane Alliance for the opportunity for this partnership. It's really been great uh, across the country. So thanks a lot. Enjoy the event. Good morning and welcome, everyone. I'll be brief. My name is Laura Reynolds, and I am a senior project manager at the Dana Alliance for Brain Initiatives. Um, this year we are oh, I'm sorry, I see you. <laughs> this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, and in honor of that anniversary, I'd just like to read you this statement. In April 1993, a press conference was held in Washington, D.C. to announce the launch of the Dana Alliance for Brain Initiatives. The founding members of the Dana Alliance pledged their commitment to advancing the public awareness and education about the progress and promise of brain research and to disseminating information on the brain in an understandable and accessible manner. I share this quote by David Mahoney, former chairman of the Dana Foundation, who two decades ago said, we all have a stake in neuroscience. At some time in our lives, every last one of us will experience a brain-related disease, disorder, or brain injury. Neuroscience research is lifting the burden of brain, disease and brain diseases and disorders. It is unleashing our potential as individuals and it is revolutionizing our attack on the social and economic problems that face our nation as we enter the 21st century. All that we are and all that we hope to be is centered in the human brain. And that's why neuroscience is truly the human science. 20 years later, we celebrate the achievements of the Dana Alliance and applaud the ongoing commitment by its members to share their knowledge with the public for the betterment of all. So I thank you for coming this morning, and I hand you over to Drew Scott, our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Hi, everybody. Uh, I see so many smiles. Uh, we're in a good, upbeat mood. Now, I'm, I'm, did anybody float away last night during the rainstorm? <laughs> good, good. Uh, were any of you thinking about building a boat and putting some animals on it? <laughs> yes. Well, we're glad um, so many of you are here today uh, after that uh, terrible weather last night. Uh, my name is Drew Scott. I'm the senior correspondent and weekend anchor at News 12 Long Island. Uh, I've been uh, in the broadcasting business for 43 years. I'm a member, proudly, of AARP. And uh, I guess they figured since they have a senior correspondent, they would ask me to moderate this today, so that's why I'm here. Um, I'm proud to introduce to you our two special guests today. Uh, to my left is Dr. Patricia Coyle. She is a professor and vice chair of clinical affairs the Department of Neurology at Stony Brook University School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Coyle. And Dr. <laughs> and Dr. Dennis Choi uh, on our 
third chair there as the professor and chair of neurology and director of Neuroscience Institute at Stony Brook University School of Medicine. So we're very happy to have you too. So there's so much knowledge about the brain sitting to my left, I'm feeling intimidated already, and I know you have questions. So we were gonna have roving mics. Uh, during the time that uh, we're speaking today, if you have a question, and I'll call for questions throughout our discussion, uh, please feel free to stand up, raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone over to you so you can ask a question. So let's dive right in, and uh, what we'd like to do is get started by talking about the brain. And uh, let's, ask, uh, let's ask Dr. Choi uh, to give us a very brief primer on brain function to kick off our discussion. Okay. Um, well, it's a privilege to be here. I, I'd like to add that I'm a proud member of the Dane Alliance for Brain Research and also a proud member of AARP. Um, so the brain. Uh, the brain is up here, um, in case you're wondering. It's about three pounds of tissue in the average adult, um, but it's an especially important three pounds of tissue because it's responsible for basically doing everything that we are aware of, all our thoughts, all our plans, all our memories, all our hopes, all our feelings, all our ability to feel or to move uh, emanates from uh, those three pounds. And one way of, uh, another way of, uh, recognizing how very important those three pounds of tissue are. And of course, the brain is connected via a structure called the brain stem to an extension of the nervous system down the back called the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is the conduit through which uh, signals go out to the rest of our bodies. They control our arms and legs, and heart and the like. One way of recognizing how very important these three pounds of tissue are, I mean, think of your body weight, which in most cases is more than 100 pounds, uh, and then you've got three pounds of brain tissue. Well, that three pounds of brain tissue takes about 20, sometimes even 25 percent of your heart, of your blood flow and your meta metabolic capabilities. So that the brain is hogging uh, blood supply and metabolic fuel because it's really working hard all the time. Dr. Coyle, uh, tell us about uh, the normal changes in the brain as we get older. I'm not to say old, older. That's okay with you, right? Good way to say it. I too am delighted to be here as a proud member of the Dana Alliance to speak to you. As the brain ages, it does shrink somewhat, and we know that very well. It, it's actually shrinking from the time we pass adolescence. However, there's good news. Years ago, we thought that the brain cells existed and when they died, they could not be replaced, that there was no growth or renewal or generation of new cells within the brain. It turns out that's not true at all, that there is ongoing development of new cells. And our brain, which is really, I think of it as the master organ of the body that really controls everything, the most important organ that, can train, that controls our intelligence, our personality, our soul, can really learn from experience. And you can actually see changes in brain circuitry. And we can actually, I think, positively try to build up brain reserve by certain activities that we're going to hear about. So although there is some, some loss and shrinkage of tissue with aging, I think aging well can really maximize, maximize reserves of our brain. Dr. Choi, uh, let's talk about uh, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, some of the diseases that affect the brain directly. Can you discuss a couple of them for us? Well, unfortunately, there are, are an awful lot of diseases that affect uh, the brain. Um, the ones you mentioned, in particular, Alzheimer's disease and stroke are quite common, unfortunately, and their, their prevalence uh, does increase with age. So they, are, they are become more and more common uh, as people get older. Uh, well, I think some of the major challenges as a society that we face involve major neurologic diseases, and we've heard about two of them, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, which is a major disease as we face as we age with increasing numbers. But we're learning more and more about Alzheimer's. 
We're understanding the pathology and what goes wrong, and that is helping us to determine new therapeutic approaches that are very exciting, that are in a number of clinical trials. We're also learning associations of what makes development of Alzheimer's disease more likely, and that is pointing out ways to preventative therapy. We're also looking at identifying brain diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease at very, very early stages, early stages where there may be minimum to no uh, objective neurological abnormalities. And that's going to, I think, be critically important because if we're going to put into place therapeutic strategies, we want to do it at the earliest possible stage of the disease before there's been a lot of injury. Maybe I could add something to that to, yes. to uh, emphasize the, the great relevance of those two diseases in particular to all of us as we get older. Just a couple of statistics. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States, the second leading cause of death in the world, and it usually doesn't kill. Alzheimer's disease basically if it, uh, is a disease that gets more common with aging. It really gets a lot more common as, as individuals age. I'll give you a number. If you reach the age of 85, the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease approaches 50-50. It's that common. One view of neurologists and neuroscientists in the field is that to some extent, you, could, you really could take the position that all of us, every single last one of us, is at risk for Alzheimer's disease. In a sense, we'll get Alzheimer's disease. The only question is whether you die of something else first. So if you're lucky, your age of onset of Alzheimer's disease is 120, and something else gets you before then. If you're not so lucky, your age of onset of Alzheimer's disease is, let's say, 82. And, and in fact, you make it to 82, and you uh, manifest Alzheimer's disease. So in fact, Alzheimer's disease is not someone else's disease. It's really something that all of us have to think about. Let's discuss another component of the aging brain, and that is depression. Uh, could you give us a little description of how that could affect us? Well, I think we recognize that depression is extremely common, and depression is a brain disease. What depression really relates to are chemical abnormalities, neurotransmitter abnormalities within the brain. I like to think about depression as a poisonous symptom. It's very important to recognize, but often individuals will deny it or not be aware of it, and it may be family members and significant others. Uh, depression is sadness. It's a feeling of hopelessness. It's a feeling that no matter what you do, things won't work out, so why bother trying? It can be related to disturbances in sleep, either sleeping more or sleeping less. It can be related to changes in eating, either eating more with weight gain or eating less with loss of weight. It's really feeling that no matter what you do, it's not going to make any difference, so why try? Why even get out of bed in the morning? That's completely treatable. That's a brain disorder, okay? That's not in some, it, well, it is in your mind, but it's not imagined. It's a chemical imbalance. And it's so insidious because it stops you from doing anything. It's not only um, ruining your daily pleasure in day-to-day -day activities, but it stops you from doing health-promoting activities. It's a critical, critical disorder to recognize and to get appropriate treatment for. I often think of Mike Wallace, a wonderful uh, television and news correspondent who was a colleague of, of mine for many, many years. You may remember Mike Wallace. Uh, in the uh, later years of his life, he was uh, terribly debilitated by depression. Um, why is that? Uh, is, is, that a, is that a function of, uh, of a worry for an older person? Dr. Choi? Well, um, well Dr. Coyle, I think, has outlined uh, the impact of depression very well. And it, it also is true that, uh, that uh, depression, there, there is a peak of depression that is associated with aging. Uh, it's, of course, not exclusively a disorder of older folks. It can affect people at, uh, across the life spectrum. And it's increasingly recognized, actually, in the young, in children. But um, yes, it, it, is, it is 
the incidence does rise with aging. And it then can uh, confound and very likely actually biologically accelerate some of the damage that's done to the brain via a disorder like Alzheimer's disease. So the two are not even independent. There's some connectivity between them. And, and they, they unfortunately synergize. I think in the news recently, we've, we've heard about uh, Paris Jackson, the daughter of Michael Jackson, affected by depression. Uh, she attempted suicide the other day, so, and she's a young person. She's what, uh, an adolescent at this point, 12, 13 years old. So yes, depression uh, can affect everybody, everybody, not just the older persons. Um, Here's a subject I'd like to get into. It's one of my favorite questions. Are there differences in the way that men and women age in their brain? Who would like to go with that one first? Well, I'll just comment that uh, men and women are different, of course. And even if you look at the brain, there are brain differences with regard to weight of the brain being greater in men, but density of neurons being greater. Well, that bears repeating. <laughs> no, 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 but, but the density of neurons is greater than in women. <laughs> OK, so that, so that makes up. Uh, and there can be actually differences in uh, certain neurons in various areas of the brain. Obviously, these differences are not confined to the brain. For example, the immune system is stronger in women than in men, and that's been uh, suggested as at least one explanation, one explanation for why so-called autoimmune disorders are more common in women. So there are some intrinsic differences. Is it accurate to say that the men are from Mars, women are from Venus? <laughs> Is, Dr. Choi? Um, well, not technically. It would be completely, <laughs> it would be completely technically accurate. Um, but it, it is true, as Dr. Coyle says, that neuroscience is recognizing more and more that there are uh, definable differences in the structure and the way the, the brains of men and women, on average, work. Now, the differences are, are, you could say, small relative to the difference between, of course, a human brain and, and another, uh, another kind of brain. Uh, but the, but they're, uh, they're real, and, and they produce differences in the way men and women, on average, uh, use their brains, uh, on average in um, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, probably taken together, most people in this room would agree that women, on average, are smarter than men. But you know, basically, there are, there are differences. Men are better at a few things. I'll try to think of one. Um, maybe, maybe recognizing aircraft would be something very important that I think men are better at. But there, there's something out there. Uh, but actually, there, and these differences do extend to, to uh, the way uh, Alzheimer's disease affects the brain. It is true that more women than men have Alzheimer's disease, uh, although a large part of that is, is related to the fact that women have longer lifespans. So an age-related process like Alzheimer's disease is going to be more prevalent. More recently, I think some studies have started to recognize that men are at greater risk for a state called mild cognitive impairment. So that's more typically seen uh, statistically in men than in women. And, and there are some differences in the way Alzheimer's disease if you really get down into the science, appears to progress in men and women. All right, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to get into a next, the next subject is learning and memory. But before we do that, I know you have questions that have come up. So we're going, we're going to take a few questions right now. We have the hand microphone right there. I'd like you to stand up. Give me your first name. Dennis, OK, and uh, what is your question? What about heredity? My mother had it and died, and I'm the firstborn. It scares right. me. <laughs> what about heredity? Uh, in, in relation to Alzheimer's uh, or uh, a stroke? OK. OK. okay. Right. So uh, a small percentage of Alzheimer's disease will be genetic, typically autosomal dominant. And they are identifying genes called the amyloid precursor gene, the presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. The vast majority of Alzheimer's are, are not familial, but a small, very small proportion, less than 5% are. And so there is risk when there's a positive family history, certainly, but there are positive things that you can do. Um, and I think what's very important for all the major neurologic diseases that we're talking about here, 
for the small proportion that may be familial, that's a wonderful research subject to look at because you analyze the genes, you figure out what that gene does, and it gives you critical insight into the disease, even though that's not directly applicable to the whole disease. And, and so it really gives you great insight, and you begin to understand the disease and hopefully be able to develop treatment strategies. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Choi, uh, would it be accurate to say that Dennis is, um, uh, uh, faces a, uh, a possibility, but not inevitable doom of Alzheimer's? Yeah, yes, uh, th that's certainly accurate. We all face Alzheimer's yes. disease, as, as I outlined. I think if you, if you run the numbers, assuming uh, that there is not a specific familial form of Alzheimer's disease running in the family, if we're talking about the sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is here and there and is yet to be linked to, to uh, a powerful single gene mutation. Still, I, I think on average, you know, having family members um, express Alzheimer's disease is a risk factor, so it bumps up one's risk a bit. But w basically, it's, it's a relatively small bump and so it certainly wouldn't mean an inevitability. So Dennis, you're at risk, but you're not doomed, okay? But we're so all take heart. That. All right, right. Um, another question over here, please. Give us your name. I'm Jean. Hi, Jean. Uh, uh, my children would very much like to know how their father uh, died of Parkinson's. Uh, there's been no one else in his family who had Parkinson's. They would very much like to know what their risk for Parkinson's is as his children. All right. Who would like to go with that first, Dr. Choi? Well, similar to the situation with Alzheimer's disease, there are some rare familial forms of Parkinson's disease. So if, if that were to be in the family, then, then that would convey a, a definable and significant uh, risk. If that isn't the case, it's somewhat the same situation. In other words, having close relatives express Parkinson's disease is a risk factor, but it doesn't mean inevitably that um, all relatives will get Parkinson's disease. What tends to increase the risk in, in both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, if, it, if we're outside of the zone of a familial uh, genetically uh, determined, typically dominant, uh, form of the disease, it would be a greater risk with an earlier onset. So if one has relatives that express earlier onset, so if one, it, it, one has family members that come down with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease at a younger age, that, that is a higher risk factor than if they come down with the, that, those disorders in, let's say, their 80s or 90s. Thank you. We have a, now, um, uh, stand, stand up again. Stand up again. Yeah, it, it's, a it's a continuum. So 70 is younger than 80, 60 is younger than 70, okay. and the younger you get, the, the stronger the risk. But it, it still stays relatively modest as an impact factor. So okay. unless, but if you talk about somebody who gets, say, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease in their 40s, that would typically point towards a familial form and a potentially very significant risk. Thanks. Let me take uh, one more question. Uh, over here. This we young have lady right here. In the second row. And uh, I'd like to caution you, when you ask a question, don't give us a, a, a personal um, example. Keep it uh, a little nonspecific, all right? That protects your privacy and uh, makes it a little easier for us to answer. My name is Susan. Hi, Susan. And I'd like to know if there's a test that you could take to see if maybe you'll get Alzheimer's or a Parkinson's. Like, I'm 60, so. My children would like to know, but I'm afraid. Keep it non-specific. I'm afraid. Non-specific. Oh, there you go. But I'm afraid to find out. I All right, is there a test? So good question. The, that's a very good question. So the short answer is no. There's no test to be done. Now, there's very interesting work being done in both disorders. So when we think about Alzheimer's now, you can think about perhaps three stages. There's the Alzheimer changes that are occurring in the brain, but there's no clinical features of it. This is a pre-symptomatic stage. Then there's the mild cognitive impairment, where there's a little bit of cognitive issues, but it's not interfering. And then a proportion of those go on to actually show Alzheimer's disease. 
They're very interesting studies looking for biomarkers that are being done with neuroimaging tests, such as PET scan and spinal fluid analysis, that are possibly going to be able to identify Alzheimer in the presymptomatic silent stage, where it has the pathology, but there's absolutely no sign yet. And I think that will be wonderful, because when we get treatments, that's where you'd like to introduce it. Same thing for Parkinson's. There's very interesting studies suggesting that gastrointestinal problems, constipation, loss of smell, disorders of sleep, may pre and sometimes mood disorders, may precede development of the clinical features of Parkinson's. And again, there are big studies that are ongoing to try to establish that. So this is kind of the excitement of the future and what we're learning. But the short answer is no. There's no test to be done right now that's going to tell you. All right, now what we're going to do is move on to another topic. I know you, a lot of you have questions, so we're going to take them. We'll get to you. Don't worry. Not to worry. Uh, we're going to talk now about memory and learning. And Nobel laureate Eric Kandel says, there's no memory without learning, but there is learning without memory. So let's talk. What, what is, what is uh, learning and memory, and how does it relate to brain aging? Dr. Choi. Well, Memory is, is our ability to um, change our nervous system through experience. Right. And so usually as the term is used, it, it means thing, it refers to things that one can consciously retrieve, so information that you remember. Learning is typically used in a, in a broader fashion uh, to, and I think that's where the Kendall quote, quote is going, to refer not only to memory, which of course by definition is a form of learning. You, somebody tells you a fact, you remember it, you've learned that fact. But you also can learn things that you can't really express verbally in, in a conscious fashion. For example, you can learn motor skills um, or you can, you can learn habits. Well. well, again, I come back to this concept. Obviously, it's not accurate, but the, the brain is like a master computer. And we're actually encoding and storing our memories there. And old time memories, things that happened many years ago, that's the hardest thing to lose from the brain because they've been encoded and put down. There's a process of that encoding, putting memories in. There's short term memory and then there's long term memory. And you can actually see things that interfere with the ability to lay down short term memory and you actually can't get it encoded in the in the master computer of part of the brain. Obviously, this is a, a very important topic to learn more and more about because we do know with aging that our memory is not quite as good. My memory is not as good as it was 20 years ago. That sort of thing happens as a part of uh, aging. But certainly, there's a lot of research and studies going on that are trying to discover how we learn and then how we make memories and how we can boost that or enhance that. I'll give you a good example of that. I can remember lyrics from uh, songs from the 60s, but I can't remember the story that I covered yesterday. So there you go. Uh, but that's normal, right? Okay. <laughs> and and uh, Susan asked, is there a test uh, uh, whether you might uh, be uh, susceptible to Alzheimer's? And the answer is yes, uh, it's if you continually lose at words with friends. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's a, only Alec Baldwin does that on airplanes. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the hemisphere of the brain. Now, we always talk about left brain, right brain. Uh, how, how is that um, defined? Dr. Choi. Okay. Um, well, of Am course. I in my left brain right now? Yes, you are. Uh -huh. uh, most likely. Are you right-handed? <laughs> I am right-handed. Okay, then I'll say you are. Um, so the reason why I knew that is because uh, we do know that the brain actually specializes. So the, it's not just two equal halves doing all the same things at all times. Um, in most individuals, in virtually all right-handed individuals, uh, and actually a majority of left-handed individuals, the left brain is the part of the brain that specializes in language. So you, or your ability to understand what somebody is saying or understand what you read, and conversely, your ability to um, communicate verbally or in writing is mediated by circuits in the left part of the brain. That, that's a, 
particularly striking example of hemispheric specialization. The right hemisphere likewise uh, specializes in certain things. For example, one's ability to find, to, to basically position in space and find one's way somewhere you want to go. You want to go to the living room. You have a map of your house in your brain. You know exactly to turn left, turn right. The right brain it takes dominance there and, and basically takes charge. So th those would be examples of, of hemisphere specialization. And learning and memory, is that left brain, right brain, or somewhere else? Well, learning and memory is actually, to a certain extent, on both parts of the brain, but particularly in, in special areas uh, of, that are called the temporal lobe, the anterior temporal lobe, the hippocampal, some of the older areas of the brain, bilaterally, actually involved. All right. Uh, can we continue to learn throughout life is that a fair question to ask? And can you give us some specific examples? I sincerely hope so. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, there's no question, of course. I mean, at this instant, you're, you're, you're continuing to lay down memory tracks. You just uh, heard the moderator's question and could repeat it back, most likely, if you needed to. Um, so our, fortunately, our, our, our ability to remember and to learn uh, persists lifelong, uh, and we uh, these abilities are essential uh, for our ability to function. Uh, they remain very strong. There are things that we can do to keep them as strong as possible, and that might be a topic that we get to in a little bit. And unfortunately, these are processes that are uh, deeply impacted in conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what is mindfulness, a term that's come up from time to time? What is that? Well. My thinking of mindfulness is really awareness, uh, awareness and using your brain and trying to maximize use of your brain. And I think really an awareness of brain health, I think that's really critical. It's a use it or lose it phenomenon. Uh, I think it's very, very important to try to maximize use of our brain because I think that promotes sprouting, it promotes um, development of circuitry or reinforcement of brain circuits. There are brain circuits that if you never do something, you don't use that. If you force yourself to do it, you use it. My concept of mindfulness is really somebody who has awareness of trying to maximize use of their brain, their mental functions. Yeah. And that's, see that, again, that's words with friends on your, your iPhone or your there you go. I think one of the things that uh, has really hurt me is uh, uh, auto dialing. You know, you, you see someone's name or phone number, you just hit that. And you, you, previously, before all these gadgets came into vogue, you, you had to remember somebody's phone number and it was good for you, right? Uh, now, let's go back to questions on learning and memory. Who has some questions on learning and memory? This uh, gentleman over here has had his hand up for a while. And, uh, Hi, my name is Bob. I was wondering, I have ADD. How does that affect me? I can't, I don't stay focused. How old are you? Uh, I'm 75. 75. I've had this since I'm a child. It affected me with my schoolwork. I, I, I'm a dreamer. And I was wondering what that effect I, uh, has on me. Okay. Your, your name again is? Bob. Bob, okay. Who would like to answer Bob's question? Well, you, you know, if you have ADT, as we know, it's an attention deficit disorder, it says nothing about your intelligence. That, that doesn't affect your intelligence. Very smart people have ADD. It's, but the impact is to recognize that and appreciate it in schooling so that the special, um, criteria are made to allow a person with ADD to learn well and not have them go through school and not do well because they weren't appropriately accommodated and feel that they're not doing well in school because they're stupid. And that's not true at all. So ADD does interact and affect how you pay attention. And there are ways around that. There are tricks, there are cognitive tricks that can be learned through therapy, 
There's also sometimes medication that can help. And people with ADD should be able to do just as well as somebody without ADD once they realize what they have. And if it's significant enough, then they can accommodate through therapy and, and techniques learned and sometimes use medication. But you should be able to be very, very successful in life. My wife says that I have ADD because I use the channel surfer, you know, the, the remote like this. I'm always going like this. But I always wind back up on uh, News 12, Channel 12. <laughs> Another question. Yes, Hi. please. Hi, I'm, my name is Judy. Hi, Judy. When does the forget, forgetfulness that we all experience, forgetting our car keys, when does that require intervention? When do you start worrying about things that you've forgotten? Dr. Choi? That's a very good question. So against this background, which a neurologist called benign senescence, meaning that all of us lose uh, progressively some of our ability to, um, to remember with uh, the years, Alzheimer's disease, of course, typically does affect uh, memory functions uh, very prominently. But the way to think about it is if one thinks of benign senescence as a very, very gradual slope, and as I, the older I get, the more I like to think that as I lose memory capabilities, I more than compensate for that by, through experience and other things that I progressively learn as I get older. This is a gentle slope. Alzheimer's disease is not a gentle slope. So that's what you basically need to know. It, things uh, progress much, much more rapidly. And before long, unfortunately, the, um, the effects on memory reach the point where routine daily activities become progressively difficult. Balancing a checkbook, getting from place to place, recognizing members of the family. At that point, that is not benign senescence. Want to add that to that, Dr. Coyle? There are so many things that can affect memory. You didn't get a good night's sleep. You have a lot on your mind. You're stressed out. Uh, some of the medications that we may be given for various reasons can affect memory. We're all going to experience that. The more stressed out, the busier you are, the less sleep you've gotten, the poorer your memory is temporarily going to be. Um, I totally agree with what Dr. Choi said. I think when other people begin to comment that you're having problems with memory, then that may be a feature. But things like forgetting your keys, that can be affected by so many things. We're not going to have perfect memory all of the time. It's very vulnerable to all of these situational type issues. There you go, Judy. OK, uh, uh, I, I forget where I park my car all the time, so I just hit the panic button. You know, that's, a very, that's great for memory. Uh, let's see. Um, OK, you got the mic. Oh, the, you, you win by default. Hi, my name is Ann, and there seems to be like some overlap between memory loss, dementia, and then I need to distinguish between dementia and Alzheimer's. My mom is, is almost keep, 91. Keep it uh, more Okay, so could you, could you just address distinguishing characteristics between memory loss and what is considered dementia and, and how that's different from Alzheimer's? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Choi. Well, memory, memory loss is a symptom. It's very specific. It means your memory is, is being um, impaired. And it can be a symptom of a variety of conditions in, besides Alzheimer's disease. It can happen transiently, as Dr. Coyle says, due to um, events like poor sleep at the moment. But in terms of a more chronic memory loss, there are, there are a number of diseases which can produce that, including stroke. Uh, can selectively, in, if in certain kinds of stroke, can impair memory. So it's just a symptom. Alzheimer's disease is, a, is, I'll call it a specific disease, but science now recognizes that what we call Alzheimer's disease is a cluster of diseases. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a group of related diseases. So that's Alzheimer's disease. Dementia is a broad ca classification. Alzheimer's disease is a dementia, but there are other kinds of dementia. Parkinson's disease actually itself can produce a dementia. Uh, another kind of dementia that's been in the news uh, recently has been uh, dementia pugilistica. So people, in particular, dementia pugilistica, 
Uh, athletes in particular who sustained multiple uh, head injuries, or unfortunately some of our soldiers coming back from the war who've had head trauma, that can over time produce a dementia. It's got nothing directly to do with Alzheimer's disease, at least at the beginning, but it produces an impairment of multiple cognitive domains that, that's chronic and persistent, which basically is a dementia. One, yes. one, one way to think about it is dementia has to involve multiple cognitive issues. Dementia is never going to be simply a memory problem. Got to have more than that. So even though memory is what we can focus on so much, if you have an isolated memory problem, but attention, concentration, abstract reasoning, being, being able to make a smart judgment, you have to have multiple areas involved for dementia syndrome, not just memory. We're going to move on now. Uh, again, uh, if you have questions, we'll, we'll get to them eventually. Uh, many of us worry about our memory, and we want to talk more about that. But for the moment, let's talk about some good news about the aging brain, some news that may help us worry a little bit less. Brain plasticity, interesting phrase. Uh, define it, uh, Dr. Choi, first. Um, well, maybe I should defer to Dr. Coral, because okay. you, you, you introduced the topic earlier. Yes. In the hour. This is the concept that we can change brain function by our learning interactions, by what we actually do. I spoke about circuits of the brain. Well, you can actually show through exercise, through cognitive tests, et cetera, that you can change circuitry within the brain. Uh, we now know, as I said, that, that cells can regenerate. You can actually... Uh, uh, perhaps cause new cells to be laid down, new connections to be made. There are positive things that we can do to help our brain health. And this concept of plasticity is the fact that the brain changes based on, on learning experiences and what happens with the brain. I think this really emphasizes brain health and that we can take positive steps with regard to our daily activities and what we do to promote brain health, to combat the development of aging, uh, related uh, stroke, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, even Parkinson's. I would come back to multiple sclerosis. We can do things to help to prevent that by promoting our brain health. Uh, can you give me an example, Dr. Choi, of uh, uh, working on our brain plasticity? Uh, it, would it be a good thing for older persons to take on a new task or learning a new uh, task of some kind. Maybe uh, if you've never worked with a computer, would it be good to learn uh, uh, computer uh, technology or some part of uh, the process of working a computer? Very much. Yeah. So I think, I think we've, we've touched on this topic several times already in, in our conversation. But the brain, as our most important organ, uh, will benefit from uh, some attention to its health, just like any other organ, like our heart. Um, and so the ability of the brain to, um, to be plastic, uh, which at this, I'll put it at a cellular level in case you find that interesting. Um, just in terms of numbers, we have about 100 billion neurons in, in our brains. Each neuron is forming typically thousands of connections with its peers. And these connections are always being moved around. They're basically strengthening, weakening, adjusting, and th that's the way our brain, our computer, uh, basically learns new, f new things and processes, analyzes that information, expresses our feelings, et cetera. All of that's happening at the cellular level through these changing connections and these hundreds billion neurons and, and some non-neuronal cells as well. So all of that's going on. We can, in fact, aid and abet the process. If, you, if somebody said, how can I keep my heart healthy? Everybody in this room would, have some, would I'm sure, know that, that there would be things you could do to strengthen your heart and, and make it more resistant to age-related disease. That's absolutely true of the brain as well. And coming back to your question, uh, specifically taking on new intellectual challenges is clearly one of the things that one can do to kind of keep that plasticity uh, cranking, keep our brains vigorous and healthy. Someone mentioned to me the other day, I don't know if there's anyone here of Swiss ancestry, but somebody told me that actually in Swiss culture that it's, it's um, common, it's believed, it's encouraged 
uh, that one in later life should learn a new language. I think that's a wonderful idea, and that's exactly along the lines that you were actually talking about learning a computer language. But um, I, that's, one of, that's one of my own personal ambitions, is basically a bit later when I have a few less responsibilities uh, at work, I would love to learn a new language, and I think that that would be both fun and, and sort of uh, rewarding, and would touch on a couple of the, of the AARP uh, goals, which we all endorse. It, it would be intellectually stimulating, and it probably would be socially enabling to learn a new language. Do our brains get better with age well, in guess, certain skills? I guess it's how you define it, but I would be positive in agreeing with that uh, statement. I think um, an older brain brings the whole wealth of their experience, and that's something that can only come with age. I think, again, it really comes down to a use it or lose it. Very important to promote brain health by keeping active in reading, in new experiences, in taking courses, in learning new skills, in challenging your brain, challenging your thinking, you're physically, anatomically, at a cellular level, helping it. Use it or lose it. Very, very, very key. Uh, my wife uh, hates to fly, and uh, I coaxed her to get on a plane to go to San Diego a few years ago, and the cockpit door was still open, and she saw the pilot, and he had a full head of gray hair, and she said, Oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> but, right? Absolutely. It's, it's uh, with age comes experience and uh, level-headedness. Right. Uh, teenage brains uh, take her terrible chances. Um, and, and we hear so many tragic stories of teenagers getting themselves into tragic situations. Um, but that shows you the difference in the brain as it ages. Am I correct? You're absolutely right. Here, here's, here's a fun fact. I mean, there are different peaks for, for abilities. There's sort of a general, uh, unfortunately, downward trend in raw processing power in, in, in the brain with time. Your hearing actually peaks probably one of, it's one of the first things that peaks is your hearing abilities, which actually hits a peak somewhere around age 12. How, how many of us would like to have, be in an airplane piloted by a 12-year-old because of <laughs> his or her perfect hearing? All right, now I'm opening it up to a, a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask, um, uh, ask you to give us a specific example of a new skill that you're taking on to help your brain. Anybody taking on new skills? Tell us about it. Yes, please, right here. Stand up. What's your name? Diane. Hi, Diane. Uh, I, went to, I went to Stony Brook, and I took the project management course, and I'm studying for a PMP. Certificate. How, I, I, question, how has it affected you? How do you feel? Uh, I feel much better. Uh, I know that I'm going to be able to do it. And it, it's like it, it reinforces the things that I've learned all these years. I never knew there was a certificate that you could get. And it will help me get an, a new and better job. Is it helping your memory, your brain? Yes. yes. In, in, what, in what ways? Well, now there's also aspects to that particular certificate, mathematical equations that I have to learn. And I was like, oh my God, I have to remember math all over again. It's <laughs> taking me back to what my daughter was learning in algebra. So it's reinforcing all those aspects. Wonderful example. Another example of a skill that you're, you're taking on? And Diane's a new ARP volunteer too. So Wonderful. She, yeah, so. Right. There's another hand yeah. back there, Will. Um, just a specific skill also is a hand over here, too. Uh, I'm learning to play bridge yes. and trying to learn to juggle. Wow. 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 Bridge and juggle. <laughs> Jumble is the, the uh, word um, game? Yes. Juggle. Oh, juggle. juggle. Oh, juggle. Juggle. Very good. <laughs> Three balls or four? Because I've only been able to master two so far. <laughs> Wonderful, good. Another uh, hand over here, please. I'm learning Spanish. I'm taking a Spanish class. I took Spanish in college and I didn't remember a thing. And so now at least I could count up to 20. I remember a few, how to, a few of the words and I could speak just a, 
Oh, Poco, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> Have you found it helps your brain? Um, whenever the, the, the instructor says she's going to give us a test, then suddenly I study a little more, and then I, I could be tested because I would understand and know, know a few things. Excellent. Oh, good. Very good to hear that. Mucho gusto. <laughs> uh, another hand right over here, the young lady over here. Hi, Denise. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, there you go. Thank you. And it's, um, I teach uh, older adults at a church situation, and I see how it has helped them tremendously with their learning ability and their ability to retain a lot of words and things like that. And it's funny how a lot of language students, when they learn another language, um, for example, I, I started out learning Spanish, and then I also had French, but I didn't have anyone to speak with when I was speaking French, so I lost a lot of the French. So now what I'm doing is that I'm bringing back the French, and that is helping me tremendously to remember things. So it's so important for all of you to take another language. Really, it really is. It'll help you tremendously. Wonderful. Okay. New skills. That's very important. Let's move on to another topic now. And we've touched on this quite a bit. And the normal changes that come with memory and age. Now, uh, is it normal for us to forget names of dear friends that we knew a number of years ago? And why does that happen? Who wants to do that first? Dr. Coyle? As we get older, it is very common for us to have a memory that's not working as well. There are many things that can impact on memory, as I mentioned. Um, there are specific tricks that you can do to improve that. You're going to be able to remember if you're not distracted. So if you have a lot going on, there's a lot of noise in the background like we're hearing next door. Uh, if you don't get enough sleep, sleep is very important. You, you really ideally want to get a replenished uh, sleep because that helps the brain uh, to work. Um, if you're under a lot of stress, uh, the brain and, and memory is going to be um, affected. If there is depression, that's uh, critical. As I say, I consider it a poisonous symptom, critical to, to uh, treat. So there are tricks of the trade that you can learn to help memory as you get older, and that is something that's not going to be quite as good. But again, health promotion, making sure that you take care of brain health, but also body health, body health in general. The more physically fit you are, the better your brain is going to work, the better your memory will be. Are there certain brain foods that will enhance our memory? Dr. Joy? I'm not sure that this has been totally pinned down, but the answer is probably yes. I mean, it's, it's certainly yes at the level of a healthy diet. So if we, you know, we say, is it, is, is it health promoting? Is it brain health promoting specifically to eat right? No question. Are there specific foods that, through their almost pharmaceutical abilities, would be health, brain health promoting? Less, less clear, but I'll, I'll throw out a couple of clues, not that I feel anybody should rush out and eat A or B, but just to give you some idea of the kinds of thoughts that are going on now in the field. People know that in general, for example, fruits and vegetables are, are health promoting. You know that that's a, a basis for a healthy diet. Scientists have begun to see if they can isolate certain elements, and, and there have been experiments, for example, where laboratory rats are instead of rat chow are given blueberries. They think they've died and gone to heaven. And then those rats that get the enhanced diet actually can outperform on mental tasks the, the rats that are eating the plain old rat chow, which contains all the standard ingredients that science believes is, are necessary for health. So that would be one, uh, that would be one example. And a, a, a human example that I could cite uh, is when one epidemiological fact that, that interests everybody is the fact that uh, Alzheimer's disease incidence in India is relatively lower than in, other part, in some other parts of the world, including the United States. And people have begun to wonder if there was something in the Indian diet that might contribute to that. And of course, the obvious lead candidate would be curry. So there's been some experiments to take curry 
and, and work on it experimentally. And there actually is evidence that, that, some, of the, that uh, some elements in curry might be beneficial in, at a biochemical level in helping to stave off some of the changes of Alzheimer's disease. So I think this is a stay tuned would be the, the general uh, answer to your question. This is where science is very much interested in this question. But meanwhile, no question about it that focusing on eating a, a healthy diet, one uh, that has uh, bountiful fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, is something that we all should be doing. We even talked about the Mediterranean diet as being yeah. very positive, uh, correct? Yes, and so there, science has taken it one step further. The Mediterranean diet has now been pretty well validated through larger study as being health promoting, longevity promoting. Science believes that, that one can identify specifically olive oil and nuts, and perhaps also red wine as, as pillars of that diet success. Um, so that's, again, moving from the general to the specific. Uh, we're going to move on to our part two now of our discussion. That's brain disease and disorders. And uh, we've, we've touched on this, but let's uh, define it some more. Uh, talking about dementia and Alzheimer's, memory loss versus Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, specifically, um, what would be a, a first indicator of someone uh, developing Alzheimer's disease? Well, I really think if you have other individuals that are noticing an issue, um, by definition, uh, at the stage of Alzheimer, there has to be interference with daily activities. So the cognitive issues, and, and, and memory would certainly be affected in, in Alzheimer, in any dementia syndrome, but it has to be more than that. Uh, it's impacting sufficiently in daily activities that other people, family members, friends at work are going to notice issues. So you could have fall off of work performance. You could have somebody who begins to be forgetful that's beyond the norm, for example, driving to a spot and forgetting in the middle of driving where they're going, um, where they begin to not recognize, you know, family members, daily activities that they can't, they could keep a checkbook and now they're screwing up the checkbook, the finances on a regular basis. Other people are going to notice there's an issue. It's very hard to keep that hidden and it's clearly going to be more than just memory, it's, and it's going to be interfering with day-to-day -day life. And, and Dr. Choi, am I correct? Uh, there is no definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's until an autopsy is performed. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. And Dr. Coyle, I think, already um, spoke to that. There, there's certainly work in the field, as she outlined, uh, moving towards a pre-death diagnostic capability. But as we stand today, uh, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is still a clinical diagnosis. To, to add a couple of bullet items to the, to the list that Dr. Coyle outlined, just to give people a, uh, a, um, a broader sense of the domains of cognitive function, uh, intellectual function that can be affected by Alzheimer's disease, besides the ones that she uh, mentioned, which are, are the biggies. Um, I might also add to the list uh, language uh, difficulties. So people with Alzheimer's disease not infrequently will have um, some progressive difficulties uh, with, um, in particular, spoken language expressing themselves. Sometimes people will start to talk around the point because they can't come up with the right words, word finding difficulties. Uh, there can be um, some um, atypical, meaning for the individual, difficulties with emotion, so people can become irritable and, and sort of emotionally labile. And you know that's not them, that they've gone through decades and decades, and that's never been the way they've reacted before, and now they're somewhat hard to, to deal with because they've become somewhat emotionally labile. And, and getting lost, which I think uh, was very much on Dr. Coyle's list, is also, a, an, unfortunately, a common symptom of early Alzheimer's disease. Thank goodness I have a teleprompter where I work. You know, I don't have to memorize anything. Uh, tell us about medications. Are there vaccines, medicines that will treat or cure Alzheimer's at this point? Well, we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's, obviously. I think anybody that got that would win a Nobel Prize immediately. <laughs> um, there are several treatments that manipulate chemicals, neurotransmitters, 
that have shown benefit in temporarily improving memory. These are focused particularly around acetylcholine. Um, there's a fourth medication that uh, really has a slightly different chemical action. These are reasonable medications. They're not really game changers as far as I'm concerned. They're not really game changers. We now know the associated abnormal brain pathology uh, that we think is, is integral to development of uh, Alzheimer's, and it really involves abnormal protein being deposited in the brain. And we know the cascade of how that abnormal protein, we, we know fairly well the cascade of how those abnormal proteins develop. We're trying to uh, develop them as biomarkers, early identification of the disease. There are very clever, very smart strategies, and this is where they tried an initial vaccine that didn't work, unfortunately, had some negative effects, but they've developed others. Um, but there are very exciting new potential treatments for Alzheimer's that have begun testing in, in clinical trials. And I think the future is very bright in the next couple of years that we're gonna have a step up in our treatment for Alzheimer's beyond the current manipulation of neurotransmitters. That's, that's okay, but not really a game changer in my mind. Uh, I know in a, a number of, uh, in, in, a, in a case uh, that I was familiar with, a person became very defensive uh, to the point of uh, when they were being diagnosed for Alzheimer's. So one of the questions, and maybe you could talk about this, Dr. Choi, uh, in diagnosing uh, Alzheimer's, um, the questions were asked, uh, who's the president of the United States? Uh, who was the last president before him? Uh, and who was the president before him? Going back uh, chronologically, and uh, what she said was, oh, you know who the president is, uh, became a little defensive like that. Is, is, does that, uh, is that common? Ye yes, it is. Uh -huh. um, so. I mean, it, I think it's fully understandable at a human level. I mean, if, if one is affected, one uh, has a, a, a reflex to try to um, work around it, and, and that's, that's an effort to work around it. And one can fully understand why, why an affected individual might become a bit defensive. Um, so that the, both of those elements, the, the sort of work around, you, you try to, you try to um, get by uh, and talk around or work around a, a difficulty that you're having remembering or doing something. And, and also the, the bit of emotional overlay, this bit of anger, that, that's a fully understandable human response to this kind of difficulty. But it's a brilliant part of the brain that's trying to hide what's going on inside the other part of the brain, I would imagine, isn't it? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, how, how late should someone continue to drive an automobile or function on their own? Or do you have any recommendations on that? Who wants to play with that one? Well, anyway, so I think they've, got, they've turned hostile on us already. <laughs> um, I'm a big believer, well, if somebody starts to have accidents, that's a huge red flag, let's face it. There has to be a very significant discussion. Okay, but I'm a big believer if there's any question at all, basically get recertified. Go through the, the driving test, be checked out again and pass it to make sure that there are no issues. So those would be kind of the, the two things that I would hi highlight on this kind of controversial area. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Choi? Well, you know, Drew, the, the existence of what is it, the amber alert tells us that uh, Every once in a while, someone gets in their car who shouldn't get in their car. And so that's, that's a fairly extreme, but unfortunately not all that uncommon situation where somebody uh, with most likely a, a, a dementia, and therefore statistically most likely Alzheimer's disease, is driving who really shouldn't be driving and truly gets lost. And, and an alert has to be put out to try to have everybody look for that person in their car. It's so difficult to judge because I have a, a dear friend, she's 86 years old, and she drives herself twice a year to Virginia uh, on her own uh, and does a wonderful job 
and uh, but she keeps busy working in an office. So uh, it's uh, a case by case basis. Age is just a number. Mm -hmm. That's right. When I, yeah. when I was at Washington University, um, I remember uh, Ollie Lowry was a very distinguished, famous scientist. And he, at, at age 90, was asked to re-chair the Department of Pharmacology. And he, got, he applied for a federal grant, one of the most difficult uh, competitive grants to get. And he got it. And his priority score was the absolute best in the entire country, wow. age 90. Wow. Amazing. That's wonderful. I'll bet he's on the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, before we uh, start talking some more about stroke, uh, let's open it up to questions about learning and memory and Alzheimer's. Uh, again, keep your questions nonspecific. Uh, yes, please. Right here, stand up. Give us your name. What's your name? Hi, Juanita. How does technology impact on the brain? the um, individual who have the need to stay connected all the time, um, having dinner, traveling, um, never giving the brain time to rest. It's just continuous connecting. How does that impact, or if it does, do you think it had some impact on the future? As opposed to isolating and being alone? As opposed to the next generation that have never been without this technology. I see, okay. Good, good question. Yeah. Well, obviously, socialization, getting out and interacting with other individuals, I think is a health promoting measure. And that probably really helps brain health. And that's a very important thing to do. I'm not a big fan of people sitting in front of a TV or on their iPad all day, not having human contact. I think conversation, human contact, et cetera, is very important. So that's to be encouraged. That helps the brain. That promotes brain health. The time for restoration is really to have good sleep. And that's another basic health issue. You want to have good sleep. And if there's an issue there, then you want to try to see how you can fix that up. Because that's the time when, when the brain can really be resting. How many hours would you recommend? So that's going to be different for individuals. There's a, there's a wide array. I can give you a, an average figure of eight hours. There are some people who can do with less. There are some people who can do with more. The bottom line is, are you refreshed during the day and able to focus, et cetera? Sleep is very important, very, very important for our general health and our brain health. Do naps help, or is it bad? Um, I'm not going to say that naps are bad necessarily. It really depends. Now, if a nap is going to stop you from sleeping at night, then there's a potential issue. But if the nap is really help, helping to replenish you, giving you greater energy, and you're able to do it, then that may be fine. Good. Can I come back to the, that earlier yes, question? Yes, please. Because there was a little bit of an edge on your question, and I wanted to address that edge. Um, I sense from the way you asked the question that you have a concern that that uh, in particular, I'll say the, the younger generation's um, affinity for, uh, for technology and sort of continuously texting, et cetera, might have a downside. And I do share that concern. In a sense, we're, we're conducting a large social experiment because we have a whole generation of people that, that multitask to a greater extent than any of their you know, progenitors and also um, depend on technology more than any of their progenitors. With regard to that, la so the, the multitasking, I'm just not sure. You can sort of see there could be a plus side in you know, keeping that brain always agile and on its toes, but there could be a downside in, in never really, or less commonly going deep and, and taking something a little bit further. In terms of depending on that little pocket device all the time, I think that there is a downside. Andrew, you, you, you've spoken to that uh, a couple times as well in the conversation, so I wanted to highlight that. Yes. Um, I'm very aware of it. You know, people say, how's your memory? I say, oh, it's about 32 gigs. It's not bad, actually. <laughs> um, but, but there really is a downside, and, and I've become more and more aware of that. And because we basically anything we need to know, we can carry around with us so conveniently, we don't work our brains as much as people used to. And I really became aware of that. I read a book recently, No Conflict of Interest. I just bought the book and read it. Um, it's, it's a fun book, which I can recommend. It's called um, Moonwalking with Einstein. And it's written by a, a journalist by the name of Jonathan Foyer. I don't know if you've read it. 
but it's a very cool book. He got very interested in sort of memory gymnastics and, and, and all, and he, he did some uh, reading of history. And he learned that basically in, in previous times, in many cultures, memory was highly prized. And in fact, for example, the ancient Romans used, had very well-developed techniques, which they used and taught widely to, to, be, to learn. You, there, were, there were fewer books. There certainly weren't any pocket uh, devices. So if you wanted to know something, you had to store it. So they exercised their brains, and they learned techniques for storing it. And progressively, and especially now in a stepwise fashion, with the available pocket phone, we don't do that anymore. And I think there could be a downside. So I, I share your edge. Yeah, some of these kids think they're so smart texting, but they're, they're, sometimes they drive themselves into telephone poles. That's right. So you don't want to do that either. Yes, please. Okay, my name is Linda, and my question is about sleep. I know it pertains to a lot of people in here. You fall asleep for a couple of hours, you wake up for a couple of hours, and then you go back to sleep again. Does that count towards your eight hours of sleep, like, say, a two-hour intermission? of wakefulness? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the hours of sleep are when you're sleeping. Uh, but that's interesting. So that's disrupted sleep to a certain extent, whether that's learned or not. And I think there are specific uh, health, uh, sleep hygiene, uh, sleep promoting measures that you can think about. So it would be better not to have the disrupted sleep. You would rather have it straight through. And there are clues, for example, that you not take caffeine or alcohol in the hours before you're going to sleep, that when you go to bed, you should be prepared to be sleeping within 20 minutes. And if you're not, you should get up and do something else, that you shouldn't be in bed eating or watching TV for any extended time. And then you would analyze why you might be getting up and what the reasons might be and looking at your performance during the day. I think the comment that I would make is that sleep hygiene is an important component of general body health that is an important component of brain health. And so you don't want to neglect that. If you have a sleep issue, it's hurting your brain. That's the way to think about it. You really need to get that fixed up. Another question back here, please. Uh, is sleep induced by a sleeping pill the same as natural sleep? Sleep induced by a sleeping pill, is that the same as natural sleep? Um, I'm not a big fan of sleeping pills. I'm really not. In theory, uh, sleeping pills are supposed to be short-term use uh, when there are issues, for example, you're traveling or there's been a, a specific event or circumstance to help you sleep. I'm really not a big fan of routine use of sleeping pills, which aren't supposed to work in the first place. So I would much rather an individual try to use natural techniques first if there's a rationale, I might use um, a, 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 a sleep prescription short-term only. I really don't like my patients to be on long-term sleeping medication. Yes. And, and there are some differences. For example, most sleeping pills are in the so-called benzodiazepine class of drugs. They, uh, while they induce sleep, the sleep is usually uh, has a reduced fraction of slow-wave sleep uh, relative to natural sleep. And more and more research. And, has pointed to slow wave sleep, deeper sleep, stage three or four sleep, as being especially important for its restorative uh, properties. So there, in fact, are some technical differences also to the type of sleep induced by uh, current pharmaceutical agents and natural sleep. We have examples uh, in the news where people are uh, taking Ambien and then getting up and going to work and driving in a nearly a hypnotic state. Yes. They still haven't fully That's awakened, issue. And, uh, and it would be a benzodiazepine which would be very dangerous. Uh, so I recommend a warm glass of milk and count some sheep. <laughs> that's, my, that's my prescription. I'm, I'm yes. Um, my name is Fran, and um, I'd like to thank you. You're giving us a lot of good information here today. And I'm just kind of thinking more proactively. Um, you told us, Dr. Choi, of things, different foods and things that we could eat. Cut to the chase, though. What's your question? Supplements. Uh -huh. um, fish oil, ginkgo biloba, anything like that that could uh, help brain function? OK. Nothing's been, been established. Um, there are all these theories. One has to keep a certain distance from these theories. Uh, do, scientists are humbled by a number of recent studies where things that were 
thought to be highly likely to be beneficial, like vitamin E, uh, turned out not to be so in a rigorous clinical trial. So I, I would say stay tuned, but no, I wouldn't recommend, I can't get behind any specific supplement at this time. It comes in a pill. One more quick question. Yes. Real. Any positive connection between yoga and meditation? And I mean anything positive, somebody into yoga or meditation, do you see any effect on the brain? Has the Department of Neurology studied yoga or meditation? I, I, I would imagine you have looked into that. I, I, I believe that there are some studies that have really suggested a benefit of things like meditation. And certainly there's data for Tai Chi uh, which is somewhat similar to yoga. Um, I think um, these are uh, valuable techniques that can have a benefit. Now, I guess the bottom line is how rigorous are the clinical trials, and I don't think you can point to extremely rigorous clinical trials, but there have been studies of, of meditation and a little bit of yoga that I think have suggested benefit. All right, we're going to move on to the next topic now. Alzheimer's disease isn't the only cause of dementia. Stroke is also a cause. Uh, can you tell us, doctors, more about what a stroke is and what effects it can cause? Stroke or brain attack? So really, a stroke refers to um, blood flow being cut off typically to a part of the brain, ischemia. Uh, or a blood vessel abnormality. Sometimes you can have a rupture of the blood vessel and you can have what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. Obviously, uh, stroke is a major concern. Uh, there is an age relationship. After the age of 55 for each decade, there's a greater than twofold risk of having a stroke. Uh, stroke is recognized as a major cause of permanent disability in individuals. Um, we know that there are identifiable risk factors that you can do things about to avoid a stroke. And when you think about what is a stroke doing, it's damaging brain tissue. When you have a stroke, you can permanently injure, kill brain cells and permanently damage uh, parts of the brain. And uh, the second most common cause of a dementia syndrome is, is a vascular dementia, where if you have sufficient number of strokes, ischemia to the brain, you can damage sufficient brain tissue to actually cause a dementia syndrome, which shouldn't be surprising. To me, the take home is how can you prevent stroke? And there are a whole bunch of general health factors. Take care of your blood pressure. Hypertension is a key link to stroke. Um, smoking. Smoking increases risk of stroke. Bad thing. Hyperlipidemia, increasing cholesterol and lipids, uh, poor diet, um, obesity, particularly abdominal obesity. Individuals that have a very protuberant abdomen, and that's where the major part of their weight is, are really suggesting a metabolic syndrome, and that's a, a marker for vascular risk factors. Um, things like physical activity, being physically inactive uh, makes stroke more likely. So stroke is something that is very, very common, it increases with aging, and a proportion of it is completely preventable. You can, phys you can lower your risk of stroke by really addressing these action items. Dr. Choi, you agree? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I've often heard that um, uh, now TIA, can we, can we talk about that um, a little bit? A TIA is a transient ischemic attack. Uh, what that is is a, um, the beginnings of a stroke that fortunately doesn't go on to damage uh, brain tissue. That's basically the way it's defined. So at onset, it looks like a stroke. It produces a, a, a loss of function. What are the warning signs of a stroke? You sh everybody should, should recognize uh, this. Uh, a stroke typically presents with numbness or weakness, uh, sudden onset, typically involving half the body, it's one of the cardinal signs. Uh, another common early stroke sign might be a, a, an abrupt difficulty with language, or an abrupt difficulty with uh, tension and confusion, or an abrupt difficulty with vision, 
or a, an abrupt headache. But all of, all of these um, stroke-like uh, symptoms, at the, at the very instant they begin, you don't know whether it's going to go on to produce a full-fledged stroke and damage a chunk of brain, or whether it will spontaneously resolve before the damage occurs, in which case it's called a TIA. You might think of it in lay terms as a warning stroke. You just dodge the bullet, but that was a bullet. Uh, so you, you, you just didn't quite go through with the full stroke, but you essentially experienced most of it and, and would do well to uh, seek medical attention immediately and look into what you can do to reduce your risk of having subsequent strokes, because you've just proven that you can have a stroke. Can I give just one little case scenario that yes. was in my training that I remember vividly? 50-year-old dentist on the golf course had less than one minute of transient vision loss, painless vision loss in one eye, and he ignored it. One month later, he had a catastrophic hemispheral stroke on the left side of his brain, giving him loss of the ability to talk, paralysis on the right side, completely destroyed his career. That brief episode of loss of vision in one eye was his TIA that he ignored, very healthy 50-year-old guy otherwise, ignored unfortunately, he had a, a, a very significant stenosis that clotted off and then had a horrific stroke that he didn't come back from. That's that a warning, stands out. warning signal to not ignore. Absolutely. And uh, I've known the, the uh, I've forgotten the uh, uh, acronym now, but uh, it, it, there is an acronym that describes uh, certain uh, symptoms of a stroke, uh, which would be a, a partial paralysis of the face, being unable to speak uh, certain words. Um, uh, can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Are you remembering the acronym I'm thinking of? I, well, no. I mean, as, right. as a neurologist, I don't use the acronym, but I, I, I think we've outlined the, yeah. the major symptoms. All right. All right. Uh, one thing that um, we uh, had in our outline that was kind of interesting, uh, and that is the matter of um, type 2 diabetes. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, surge in adult onset diabetes among our older population. Uh, is that a factor in stroke? Absolutely. Absolutely. Diabetes is one of the risk factors for stroke. Uh, type 2 diabetes in particular has a relationship with um, obesity. A diet is also a factor. Uh, so it is one of the like health maintenance, health promoting um, items that you would really want to pay attention to. It does uh, increase risk of stroke. Good. Now let's uh, open up uh, some questions now on stroke specifically. Any questions on stroke? Yes, please. My name is Denise. I'm just wondering if anything is being done with stem cell research. Coil? Uh, there's a tremendous amount being done with stem cell research. It's in relative preliminary stages. It's part of what we might consider a CNS restorative or CNS repair approach to neurologic diseases. And, and it's even moved outside the realm of neurology. But this is very pertinent for stroke, for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, for ALS, for uh, traumatic brain injury, for spinal cord injury. There are a lot of questions. What are the best sources of cells? What is the best way to deliver them? How would you do it? This is aimed more at a deficit that's already there to, to try to fix that deficit, uh, um, have new cells, uh, lay down new axons, repair myelin loss, uh, etc. And we're making real advances, so it's moved into actually treating individuals with diseases now, but it's still at a very preliminary stage, but very exciting as a future therapy to restore lost function in the, in the central nervous system. My yes. name is Marilyn, and what do you recommend the first thing you do if you think you're having a stroke? Dr. Choi? Well, that's easy. Uh, either you or most likely better would be someone else around you. You should call 911 and you should get to the hospital ASAP. Uh, one of the most 
in a, one of the most important treatments for stroke uh, is tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, clot buster. So if, if one has a certain kind of common stroke and one can get to medical attention very, very rapidly, tissue plasminogen activator can sometimes be used to open up a blood clot if it is the ischemic type of stroke and, and in some cases convert what might turn out, what might otherwise turn out to be a, a devastating stroke into a small stroke or almost like a TIA. So by all means, one should get to the hospital and, and minutes count. Uh, the term brain attack is something that you should be familiar with. Uh, the, the neurological, neurosurgical community likes to use that term to remind people that, that a, uh, an incipient stroke is every bit the emergency that everybody knows an incipient heart attack is. And, and to go back to the symptoms of stroke, to make it easy, because we, we talked about a number of details, and it may be difficult to sort of keep all those in mind. If you walk out of this room saying, the way I will recognize a stroke is a sudden onset of a major disability, weakness, numbness, thinking, vision, uh, language, doesn't matter. Sudden onset of some major disability, in, especially if you see it affecting half the body, that's very likely a, a, an, an onset of a stroke or TIA. Another question I wanted to ask before is you have not mentioned medical illnesses that cause dementia. People, I know someone who had That's encephalitis as a child, and then that becomes, it becomes um, a diagnosis years later of Parkinson's disease. Is that a disease. question? Yes, it is a okay. question. You haven't, you haven't talked about any of the medical conditions that can exposure to disease, right. now that sort of thing. You haven't mentioned that, right. and yeah, I think that plays a and part. And there's a reason, because you didn't ask it yet. Well, I'm asking it now. Thank you for asking. I tried to ask it before. OK. Thank you. Well, I, I, I would just make a, a, a general remark to uh, that. Um, dementia is a syndrome. Many things cause dementia. There are many treatable causes of dementia syndrome. Now, the major cause is Alzheimer's followed by vascular dementia. But there's a whole host of things that can do it, many reversible, and certainly systemic diseases. If you have any sort of uh, uh, kidney, uh, liver misfunction, pulmonary misfunction, endocrinologic, thyroid disease, B12 deficiency, nutritional deficiency, that's why it's so important that every patient in whom dementia is suspected goes to a physician, should be a neurologist, and gets a workup because there may be absolutely preventable or treatable things. They need to be worked up because we go through that whole list of the multiple things that can cause a dementia syndrome, including reversible or fixable causes. So that would be part of the differential diagnosis and the evaluation and workup of a newly diagnosed dementia patient. That's a syndrome. Can trauma lead to uh, uh, Alzheimer's or dementia? Well, well, trauma is certainly potentially is damage to the brain, and there can be an association. And as Dr. Choi mentioned, uh, you can have a dementia syndrome that's due to repeated trauma to the brain, the so-called dementia pugilistica that's very big in the NFL and uh, discussions now. Trauma can also lead to things like clots on the brain, subdural, that's considered an eminently treatable or curable form of uh, dementia. Uh, I'm thinking of more like a tragic situation or trauma, uh, emotional trauma. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Well, that's an interesting question, whether that can directly, that's a, that's a toughie. That's a, that's a uh, uh, toughie. There's a, very, there's a very interesting relationship between emotions positive or negative outlook and your brain function and your immune and endocrinological function. For example, in periods of stress, people become more vulnerable to infections. If you have two individuals that have been married a long time and one dies, it is a common phenomenon that the other spouse is at risk for dying sooner, and why could that be? And our emotions, our feelings, depression, etc., can have true impact on our immune system and endocrinological system and ultimately the nervous system as well. But it's an area that, that's not too well understood. Interesting. Uh, another question? Is, is there a role for estrogen therapy in dementia treatment? Dr. Coyle? 
Uh, so the question is the role of estrogen treatment in uh, dementia syndrome, and not that I'm aware of. Now, est now est uh, the estrogen is a sex hormone, and we know that the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, or some of the major ones, are not just endocrinologic hormones that have activities on reproduction and masculinization and feminization, but they also have immune system effects and they have brain effects. They have neurotropic effects. And for example, something like progesterone has been looked at as a potential brain restorative type of strategy. So this is an interesting area. All of the sex hormones, not just estrogen, impact the, the brain and they impact the immune system as well as the endocrinologic system and are being looked at for potential therapies for various brain disorders. But that, too, is at a very early stage. Let's move on to depression now. Just, uh, we've touched on it quite a bit in our discussion earlier, but uh, uh, characterized by changes in certain brain chemicals, neurotransmitters, discuss that a little bit for us and boil it down to English so we can understand it. Who wants to go first? Um, so I think the first emphasis is that, honestly, in my opinion, all the major psychiatric diseases are brain diseases, okay? And the abnormalities in the brain for things like depression, you may not be able to see a big lesion when you look at the brain, when you slice the brain, or when you do neuroimaging or conventional neuroimaging, but the brain encompasses chemicals and electrical circuits and you can find disturbances in the brain when you get down to that level. Now, it's very interesting with depression that the, there are two major approaches to treating depression. And if you use both of them, you get a better effect than using either alone. But they're relatively equivalent in isolation. One is psychotherapy. So going and talking about your problems, and this is part of the socialization, actually helps lift mood. As a matter of fact, exercise improves depression, too. But secondly is medication, and the medications, the antidepressants that we have, typically manipulate different neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, sometimes dopamine. Right now, I'm not aware, and I'd like to hear what Dr. Choi thinks, we don't have a way to look at somebody with depression and determine what's the chief neurotransmitter that's wrong in their, in their depression. So we need to play around with the medications a little bit. But in the future, it may be that we'll have a test or a biomarker that will say, oh, in your case, we need to affect serotonin plus norepinephrine. In your case, we need to boost dopamine. And it's to that level that we're beginning to advance to really treat brain diseases, including depression. Future markers, do you think? Yes, I, I, I would under, absolutely agree with what Dr. Coyle said. The only thing I could add to this conversation would be uh, I could mention that there is um, some early scientific evidence that chronic stress or depression might actually damage brain tissue. Uh, and this is coming from imaging studies, not conventional imaging studies, as Dr. Kuala mentioned, which are typically normal, but, but very uh, refined imaging studies looking uh, precisely at small structures in the brain. And that kind of evidence is suggesting that uh, chronic stress, chronic depression may through some pathways that are becoming increasingly understood and, and are part of the hypothesis actually produce frank tissue damage visible on this kind of very sophisticated imaging and in doing so m might synergize with other, other degenerative processes like Alzheimer's disease. So not only is depression itself poisonous, to use Dr. Coyle's word, but there may also be some biological synergies between depression and other frank tissue damaging processes like stroke uh, and uh, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. What causes Parkinson's uh, that we know of now? So for the majority of Parkinson's patients, we don't know what causes it, but we are getting a better and better picture. A small minority are genetic. There are genes, increasingly genes. This is only a small minority. It's very akin to Alzheimer's. But again, it's giving very important insight into Parkinson's disease. Um, 
we do know that there's a, uh, a chemical called alpha-synuclein that is the major component of what we refer to as Lewy body that is deposited. It's an, it, it, is, it, is an, it is an abnormal protein structure being deposited in the brain of Parkinson's patients, and that appears to lead to death of specific neurons uh, in Parkinson's disease. But what's really interesting is that they're now uh, tracing uh, that you can see abnormalities outside of the central nervous system, the brain, uh, in individuals that are destined to develop Parkinson's years before. I mentioned this earlier. One theory, not proven, is that this abnormal protein is being passed from neuron to neuron and is contributing to the disease. There may also be environmental factors. They're being studied also. The bottom line is we don't know what causes most of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but we are understanding the genes that are linked in the small minority, and they're going to give us insight. Um, we do understand the pathology better and better, and maybe we're able to pick up the population who's truly at risk for Parkinson's earlier to try to intervene with meaningful therapy in the future. No cure at this point for Parkinson's disease, Dr. Choi? No cure but uh, there are um, quite effective therapies for most individuals, either pharmacological or in some cases surgical involving brain stimulation and the like. How is that done? How is brain stimulation done? Yes. Yes. For, for somebody who has uh, an appropriate form of Parkinson's disease, typically one that has gotten past early management with medications, which of course is easier, uh, brain stimulation is a procedure that's uh, performed, of course, by a neurosurgeon who uh, typically with a whole team that makes careful measurements all along the way, an electrode is placed deep in the brain in, in some of the uh, so-called nuclei that, that are right in the deep center of our brain. And, and they have to get that electrode, as you might guess, precisely in the right location. And then that electrode is attached to a wire and attached to a stimulator box. And, and uh, if it's all been done properly and the patient has been appropriately selected, uh, this procedure can be very, very helpful. Uh, and so uh, people will report that when that stimulator is turned on, they get instantaneous uh, lifting of, of some of their symptoms. And it can be very, very helpful in restoring function. However, keep in mind that um, Parkinson's disease, like Alzheimer's disease, is a progressive illness. So unfortunately, even if the procedure works 90% on day one, inexorably, it will gradually fail. And, and that's why it's essential that we find uh, the root cause of Parkinson's disease and develop what are called disease-modifying or neuroprotective therapies. Now I'd like to move on to the, the successful aging. And uh, can you tell us some of the factors that um, uh, would help maintain uh, cognitive function? What are uh, some of the factors that will uh, really help the brain? Well, I think you can fall into four major categories. The first is cognitive health by keeping your brain stimulated and active and demanding that your brain continues to learn. And that's actually promoting brain health. Um, secondly, physical activity. Very important to keep physically active. Exercise is part of a health maintenance wellness program everyone should be exercising, particularly aerobic exercise. And we're not talking about being out in the gym and lifting weights and stuff like that. Walking is exercise, swimming is great therapy, but keeping physically exercised is critically important. Thirdly, socialization, interacting with others, enjoying life, uh, talking, getting the stimulation of being with people. And, and this is where it comes back to the concept that somebody who's sitting in front that never talks to somebody is probably not a uh, good thing um, at all. Um, and then finally, this concept of minimize vascular risk factors. Minimize vascular risk factors. Take care of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, smoking. Um, those kind of four prongs are really going to do the best to preserve and promote your brain health. Want to add to that, Dr. Joy? Only to underscore, because these are so, these are so important. Well, one thing that I would underscore the, is the connection between physical exercise and brain health. 
And the reason for underscoring is that it sort of sounds like a platitude. I mean, who would be against you know, maintaining your physical health? And it's something that people have always advised. There's actually more and more powerful and specific evidence linking physical activity to brain health. So it, it, this is not, yeah, everybody should lead a good life. This is actually very specifically a way to promote brain health. So some of the newer studies have linked physical activity to neurogenesis. So the ability of the brain to make new cells and rebuild its circuits, even in late life, is linked to physical activity. Uh, second, this effect is so powerful that one can, uh, one can actually identify linkages between physical activity and improved cognitive performance and even perhaps some uh, imageable changes in brain volume. It's that big an effect. So don't walk out of here thinking, yeah, everybody should exercise. If you specifically want to maintain your brain's capabilities as you age, exercise is uh, vital. Now, uh, many in our audience here uh, are often uh, hear about clinical trials that are being conducted at Stony Brook and at other universities nearby. Uh, what do you recommend for patients? Would it be good to get involved in a, in a clinical trial or study? Absolutely. Um, I think clinical trials are wonderful. Clinical trials are very controlled um, circumstances, uh, supervised by the National Institutes of Health and our Food and Drug Administration, FDA. They have inclusion, exclusion criteria, but number one, this is how we document and prove and develop our new treatments. So they're absolutely crucial. It's the only way to really have a new treatment get approved and become available to prove it in a very well-controlled clinical trial because you have to be very vigorous. So as I think about it, not only are you probably promoting your brain health by participating in the clinical trial because it's going to mentally challenge you, it's going to physically challenge you, you're going to have the social interaction, it's going to keep you you active, but you're helping to advance medicine, advance science for all of us. I, I think it's really a wonderful thing to get involved in clinical trials. All right, let's open it up to some more questions now. Uh, we uh, would invite your question. If you haven't had a chance to ask a question, uh, let's call on a new hand right over here, I believe, this young lady. Your name? Uh, hi, my name is Paula. Hi, Paula. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about aneurysms, how they develop, how they're treated, and their impact on the brain as they progress. An aneurysm um, is a blowout of, of a blood vessel, so like a tire developing a bubble, a part of your uh, blood vessel, an artery in the brain, begins to swell. So that causes two potential problems. One is by swelling, it can press on adjacent brain and cause symptoms that way, because it causes pressure and dysfunction of around the surrounding brain. The second and worse is, of course, as Dr. Coyle has mentioned, uh, it can rupture, just like a tire, and if a artery in your brain ruptures, that's a bad thing. That causes a brain hemorrhage and a stroke. Uh, are there symptoms that we should look out for in case of an aneurysm? Um, one of the things is anybody that has the, quote, worst headache of their life, uh, that's something that needs to be evaluated. Because the worst headache of your life can represent an aneurysm leak, a small leak, you can have a small leak before there is a catastrophic bleed. So that's one thing that you would think about. Um, as an aneurysm uh, gets larger and begins to press on certain areas, for example, you might um, present with problems with your eye, drooping of your lid. You, you could have what we call a third nerve palsy. That can be the signs of an aneurysm. So were you to ever develop the worst headache of your life, you really don't want to ignore that. That needs to be evaluated. If you develop a new neurological issue that's, that's not right, it's an abnormality on your exam, of course I think you should get that investigated. You don't just sit there and say, well, this is, this is natural, this is old age. That's not. You would really pay attention to that and get it looked at. What do you use? Do you use CAT scan with contrast to determine an aneurysm? What do you use in, uh, 
in, in the uh, clinical uh, diagnosis. So, so you're going to image the brain. We have the capability of imaging the blood vessels, the arterial system, and, and probably non-invasively a CT angiogram is superior to an MR angiogram. And then the most definitive way would actually be to do an angiography study where they go through the femoral artery and the groin, thread it up, and, and can actually image the dye that they've injected in the blood vessels of the brain. But a CT angiogram non-invasively um, uh, looks at the blood vessels pretty well. Most people would probably do that as a first screen. And it's possible to get an aneurysm in the heart as well. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Another question. Uh, Hi there, Doug. the brain, yeah, I'd fallen down a flight of stairs, and I cracked my, my head, and a piece of furniture landed on top of me, I lost my sense of taste and smell. My sense of taste is very diminished at this point, my, my sense of uh, smell has never come back, and this is over three years ago. Um, is was that just one incident? Effect? Was that just one incident of trauma? Yes, well, I was hit three times on motorcycles, but never had, had concussions, but never, never had no less than uh, injuries. Uh, was it diagnosed as a I had concussion? On the brain. I had I had bleed on the brain initially from the initial uh, test, but it went away, and um, you know, I have since not gained my sense of smell at all. I can't. What's, smell what's your question, though? Um, is there any long-lasting effect not having a sense of smell on, on the brain uh, and tra the trauma? Uh, you know, what's the effect? I think you're going to have to make an appointment, you know, and, and pay a copay <laughs> and get your Blue Cross card and your AARP card. Right. No. <laughs> Um, want to touch that or um, pass? It's a little personal. It's a little, you know, we're trying to keep non-specific here, but. Uh, as, as a general rule of thumb with a neurological issue, it's a general rule. Nothing in life is 100% except death and taxes, right? <laughs> um, if you've lost function, completely lost function for a year, then do not expect it to come back. That's what we say as a general rule. I think what you are pointing out is the very significant issue of basically brain trauma, head trauma, brain trauma, and concussions. Uh, I heard about three concussions. Then I heard about a fall sufficient that there was bleeding into the brain and loss of neurological function. Luckily, not more than that, but, but for you, quite, quite meaningful. I think, uh, to me, this is stressing and we're increasingly recognizing how important concussions are. Concussions are not trivial. And concussions, by the way, don't necessarily mean you have to lose consciousness. Concussion is head trauma, brain trauma that disrupts function. So you could be you know, jarred or be out of it for a bit of time, et cetera. These are bad things. And cumulative concussions are bad things. And uh, if you injure the brain, it is perhaps increasing risk for later age-related brain diseases. So concussions are something that you want to avoid if you possibly can. Yeah. Wear a helmet. <laughs> OK. Yes, over here. Hi, Florence. Yes. They do occur. Who wants to repeat, talk about tumors the in the brain? Okay. Specifically, what about? Okay. Well, well, well. Okay. So, so brain brain tumors are a major neurologic issue. Um, tumors can occur in the brain just like they can occur in any parts of the body. As we approach a brain tumor, is it a primary brain tumor or is it a metastatic, secondary, spread from somewhere else? And I can tell you, in the in individuals that we see. People can have brain tumors and present in a fairly subtle way. I can think of, of, of somebody who was just seen very, very recently because of a seizure that they had. They had a huge brain tumor uh, without much on examination because there are quiet areas of the brain where you can have the brain tumor growing and you don't have an obvious hemiparesis or loss of vision, et cetera. But in speaking to them, there were vague issues of memory not being quite as good, just function not being quite as good that went back for some weeks. This is an example of there are areas of the brain where things can be happening without any overt changes. And again, to me, 
is an emphasis for if you are really having a neurological issue that is new and persisting, you need to get it checked out. You need to get it checked out. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Pam. Um, is Stony Brook involved in research for the brain and memory? And if so, how would someone like us get involved in that? Dr. Choi? Sure. Um, very, yeah, very much. Um, and w the easiest way to find out what's going on would be to come through the uh, Stony Brook website, uh, look at the Neurosciences Institute specifically. And, and uh, studies are always coming and going. Uh, in various departments. So that would be one good way to find out what's uh, going on. In a more general sense, I'll be less Stony Brook go centric, um, there's a, a public web website called clinicaltrials.gov that allows you to look and see what clinical trials are going on nationally in any given area. And I strongly recommend that that site's maintained by our National Institutes of Health. Now, we've come to the end of our discussion today, uh, but I reserved a little bit of time where both of you doctors would like to summarize uh, what we've covered. Um, so how would you like to start first, Dr. Goyne? So I'm going to say, I'm going to say the following, and, and I've, I've come to appreciate this more and more. Um, our brain is a very precious organ. It's simply the most important brain. We can positively do things to promote our brain health, our brain flourishing. I'm seeing excellent aging individuals, people 90, 95 years of age who are as sharp as a tack, okay, and I think that that's a wonderful thing. But there's a responsibility that we all have. So to keep our brain working by embracing cognitive challenges, keep thinking, don't be isolated, critical. Physical activity and exercise, as Dr. Choi pointed out, it changes the brain, it helps the brain. So that's a, an important part of a neurological program. Think about keeping socially involved and interactive. And finally, think about your general body health, vascular risk factors, health wellness program. We touched on it. The diet, the sleep, the issue of hypertension and diabetes and hyperlipidemia, the no excessive or binge drinking of uh, alcohol. Paying attention to that general body health will allow your brain to age in an optimal manner. And really, it's so critical to daily quality of life. Thank you. Dr. Choi? Well, I couldn't add to that outstanding summary. Uh, as Dr. Coyle said, death and taxes are inevitable. But all of us have some ability to influence uh, the way uh, we approach our inevitable death. Uh, to the ex we can influence how well our brains function in our later years of life. And I, it's hard to think of something that wouldn't be more important at an individual level. So I, I could only underscore the, the points that she's already emphasized. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Choi, Dr. Coyle. Thank you for your wonderful questions, and we appreciate uh, your support today. And uh, many thanks to uh, uh, AARP for this, uh, this event, and of course, the, uh, 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 all of the folks involved, our volunteers. Uh, if you have questions, maybe we can answer a couple of them after the uh, session is over. We'll try to help you out wherever we can, make it brief. But uh, thank you again for uh, being with us today, and, and we hope to do this again. <laughs>